Hello, good crowd. Uh, I am just, I, I'm kind of giddy here. We've got Larry Sherwood, the president and CEO of the Interstate Renewable Energy Council with us today. We're talking about renewable energy, one of my very favorite topics in the whole world. Stick around, you don't want to miss this. Welcome to the Your Mark on the World show with your champion of social good, Devin D. Thorpe. Our sponsor, Johnson & Johnson, matches most individual donations up to $250 at caringcrowd.org. Larry, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I look forward to our conversation. Well, Larry, no one looks forward to this like I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be great. Um, I love having uh, renewable energy experts on the show and uh, you know, you're know you really well positioned to, to talk about the latest trends and where we're going, but uh, give us just a quick 30 second overview of what the Interstate Renewable Energy Council is and then let's talk about where this industry is going. Okay. So if you've seen solar panels on a house or a business, then you see what IREC does. We work with states to make the rules that allow those solar panels to be connected to the larger electric grid. And if you've seen workers doing a quality job on a solar installation, then you know what IREC does. We uh, credit training programs for uh, solar installers, other clean energy workers, and we also develop training programs for people who we call allied industries, which are people who have interaction with clean energy, but it's not their full-time job. So a local code official, an apartment maintenance technician, uh, people like that. And what we're seeing is that with um, cities, states, and corporations enacting these really aggressive goals, 100% clean energy in many cases, um, we're going to have to be really aggressive and think about how to make this work because clean energy, when it's connected to the grid and works for everybody, is going to be complicated and technical to figure out how to connect all these devices together in a way that's reliable for everybody. And that's what we're working on today is making that work. No, oh, fantastic. Well, these are exciting times and certainly uh, this is an exciting space. Uh, literally, uh, there is a need to replace all of the existing non-renewable energy with renewable energy sources over the next, and people argue about whether we're talking about one decade or three, but almost no one argues that we can go longer than that, uh, with few exceptions. So it's a huge, huge business opportunity, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. It's, um, it's massive. It's, you know, the equivalent to what happened when the car was introduced at the beginning of the 1900s and we started using gasoline. Um, you know, it's that type of significant transformation to our economy that uh, we're going to be doing over the next several decades. So after you pay for your solar panels, how much does it cost per kilowatt hour to get electricity off of a solar panel? Um, golly, that's a good question. Um, so once, 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 you've paid paid, once you've paid for it, you're actually getting paying zero for the kilowatt hours that are coming off of the solar panel. So it's, it's a completely different way of thinking about electricity than what you do now. You're, put, you're investing or somebody is investing at the front and then essentially after that, um, you're not paying for the solar, except for maybe a little bit of maintenance cost. Oh. So it, it, one way of thinking about it is it's a very 
expensive first kilowatt hour, but everything after that is free, right? Um, yes, you can think <laughs> about it that way, definitely. And the good news is that that expensive first kilowatt hour has been getting cheaper and cheaper um, as we go along. Yeah. And there are also are many fi different financing vehicles in place that spread that cost out. So the business owner, the homeowner doesn't necessarily have to think about it as one lump sum payment at the beginning, there are many options to spread it out over the life of the system. You know, and I think um, in terms of scale of opportunity, another aspect that people don't fully appreciate is that Americans are using on the order of 30 times more energy than say Africans or Indians. Yep, that's true. And Africans and Indi Indians want to use as much energy as we do. And so they too need to not just, they don't just need to replace their existing coal fired plants like we do. They need to add gazillion watts, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> you know, massive numbers of terawatts of energy, of clean energy on top of the replacement that needs to happen. Again, I just want to. Uh, emphasize the scale of the opportunity ahead of us. Isn't it just enormous? Oh, that's absolutely true. And in much of the developing world, there are many people who don't have electricity at all, and they have major health consequences from burning fires and burning kerosene in their houses to provide light or heat. And by using solar or wind or other renewable energy sources, they can both improve the quality of their life and decrease the health benefits. And with solar and wind, we're seeing many cases where people are installing village scale or house scale electric systems before the actual electric grid has come to that place. So it's, it's a completely different way of thinking about bringing electricity to people than the way we would have thought about it 50 years ago. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's, it's extraordinarily exciting. Now, one of the things I have begun to see and would love to get your take on is a little bit of rooftop and backyard wind. What are you seeing in that regard? Um, so small wind is what it's called, has been around for a long time. And there are certain situations where that is definitely makes a lot of sense. And I worked with an organization previously that certified those small turbines so that people who bought them had some assurance that they would really work. Um, the best markets for these small turbines are typically in rural areas, and there are farms and industrial facilities and houses um, that have very successfully deployed small wind uh, turbines. And I guess by small wind, typically what that means is that the energy that's produced from the turbine is being used directly on site at the house or the business. Right, right. Um, solar panels have been popping up in urban areas for a long time and it's exciting. You know, you drive around town now, it's hard to find a place where they don't have a lot of solar. Uh, I will just point out St. George, Utah surprises me as being a place where they have a tremendous amount of sun and not a lot of solar panels, but it's the, 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 the power off the grid is about the cheapest in the world in St. George, Utah, so no one puts up solar panels. Interesting. Anyway, sorry. Um, but almost everywhere you see solar panels. Do you think that in 20 years we'll see more rooftop wind, more of this small wind, or do you think there's something fundamental about it that it doesn't work as well? 
so I think when you talk about rooftop wind, so wind actually connected to the building, mm -hmm. there are lots of challenges with doing that technology. So I think the wind that you're going to see at distributed locations is more going to be located on the top of a tower, not on the building itself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, as we think about um, rooftop solar, one of the big controversies that is raging in almost every state and municipality, and this is right in your wheelhouse, is the, uh, the, the Public Service Commission rules uh, that the utility is wanting, right, for buying back the power, the surplus power, the traditional rooftop solar model has relied on the utility buying back power at virtually the same rate, sometimes exactly the same rate that the that you sell it. So your meter just rolls backwards and you get a net bill, net billing, right? Uh, Correct. The utilities hate that. They didn't mind so much when, when only one in a thousand homes had solar panels, but now that it's five in a hundred, it's a bigger deal. Talk to us a little bit about the state of play and where you see that going. So I think um, a couple things are happening. Um, one is that in a number of states and especially for larger solar installations, so let's say a business kind of an installation, net metering no longer exists. So they've taken that away. But what's happened is that now batteries and storage have really come into the equation. So now you can install solar plus batteries and control when you're exporting the power, or maybe you've designed the battery so you're using all the solar at your own location and you're not ever exporting it to the utility, and that's the most cost-effective way to do it. As we have more and more solar on the grid, the matching of solar plus storage is going to become more and more important. And how that actually works, um, I think, remains to be seen. What are the best models? But it could be that the utility company sends a signal when they need the electricity from the storage, and then they, ex then they control getting it um, the solar from your batteries, or it could be that they've set the prices at different times of the day that encourage, that discourage you from sending the electricity to them when it's not very valuable or useful to the greater grid or and um, getting it when it is more useful. So, you know, that's where I think the future is headed on um, the interaction between the utility and the customer. Interesting, interesting. Uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on with electric cars. And, you know, some would argue, I'd probably be one of them, that uh, over this next two or three decades, we will all be driving electric cars, plug-in electric cars that uh, yeah. operate off a of battery. And uh, so we'll be taking even more power off the grid um, even more reason why, again, the opportunity for you know, this business opportunity, building solar is so huge. So um, how do you think the existence or growing use of electric cars influences all of this? And, and what are the dynamics at, at the, especially at the consumer level? So as you add uh, electric cars, that obviously adds to the demand, but one of the nice things about electric cars is in most instances, you can decide when you want to charge that car. So the utility company can give a price signal or maybe a requirement that the car has to be charged or 
at a certain time or you would pay a penalty maybe if you were at a peak time charging. There are apps now connected to electric cars that help um, the charger decide when is the best time to be charging the car for the most efficient use of the electricity. And I think in general, what we're going to see is not only the car, but other appliances in the house and the solar system and the batteries all be integrated together. And you're going to have some type of a control system, a computer, that essentially will be maximizing the energy use in your house or at your business in a way that is also maximizing the energy use on the whole grid. Because one of the things that's going to happen is as we're adding more solar and wind, to the customer side of the meter and customers are using more, we're also going to be adding more utility scale solar and wind in order to get, reach these 100% goals. And that's really going to require more coordination between the customers and the grid to make the whole system be very reliable. And one of the key elements of that, of course, is storage. And people have long worried about the cost of storage. But there is a rapidly developing supply of cheap storage in the form of used cars, right? My Nissan Leaf, I'm embarrassed to say, but my Nissan Leaf is probably worth three or four grand. Um, and yet, that the, it's got a battery that holds uh, still probably 12 kilowatt hours of electricity. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not a great battery for driving around, but pull that sucker out and drop it in the garage, and it could be a really useful part of a home energy storage and backup system, right? It, as a complement right. to the new Tesla I'll replace it with. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> But uh, do, do you, are you talking to, are you seeing any discussion of that? I've just seen the first earliest discussions myself around used car batteries being, rather than recycled for their raw materials, being reused uh, in home and industri industrial uh, storage capacities where the weight rate ratio uh, no longer is, matters once you park. Right, right. right. Um, I have not heard of that exact example, but I definitely have heard a lot of work and a lot of conversation about integrating the electric cars into the whole house system and using the battery that's in the car as essentially storage for the house. So it totally makes sense that if you have a battery that is still good from a car, but for whatever reason, the rest of the car isn't worth it. Um, saving that battery and having it um, used in your house is a good, definitely yeah. a good solution. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Seems to me like that is a nuanced little opportunity to harvest the uh, batteries out of these cars that are now, you know, the, the early electric cars that came out in, 2011 through 2015, they're really pretty crappy, uh, <laughs> you know, compared to a Tesla, right? But now there are thousands and thousands of them uh, really about to be retired. Interesting opportunity, I think, for somebody in your industry uh, to go after. Um, as you look at your career and your work in this space, Larry, what are you most proud of having accomplished? Um, I think I'm pr most proud of the organizations that I've built and the opportunities that I've created for incredibly talented people to bring their creative energy to making clean energy happen. You know, I, I love to see other people um, thrive and I love to see 
um, all the new ideas and the great things that come into this space. And I'm sure that we're going to see a lot of new ideas five to 10 years from now that we can't even imagine today. Yeah, it, it is happening quickly, isn't it? Yeah. What's the most important lesson you've learned as you've been watching this uh, renewable energy space? I, I think my most important lesson is the importance of partnerships. And so as we at IREC have developed our program and we are a small organization, it is really important for us to partner with other organizations that can reach to the audiences that we want to reach. So, for example, we developed a training program for local code officials, and that has reached thousands of code officials over the last several years, and that's because we partnered with the professional organizations that represent code officials. So that, um, I, I think, we're really now looking at scaling um, renewable energy, and that's not going to happen in ones and twos. That's going to happen in thousands and millions. And to do that, you have to have reach into the different people with expertise that are really going to make that happen. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant observation. Uh, Larry, why did you get into this work? So I've been working in clean energy for over 40 years, if you can believe that. And when I was in college, the a long, long time ago, the Arab oil embargo happened and there was no energy or energy shortages everywhere. And I lived in a dorm, and behind my dorm was the college's power plant, and there were these big semi-trucks of oil driving up every day to deliver oil to the power plant. And I thought, you know, there just has to be a better way to do this, and this is not a long-term going to work for the long term. So I got interested in solar energy and started working in it when very few people were were working in it, but it's been very gratifying to see the growth and the changes and the implementation of clean energy that's happening yeah. now. Well, it's fascinating. You talk about that era, and I remember, uh, I, I don't remember. I have right. since learned Although I remember that era, I didn't remember this fact. I learned this yeah. fact subsequently. But, but uh, Jimmy Carter put solar panels on the White House roof. Yeah, uh, he during did that indeed. period. Yep. His successor removed them, but uh, he put them on, and it. Uh, so we, we sometimes think of uh, solar panels as being an innovation of the 2000s, but in fact, you know, this technology has been under development for a very long time, and uh, it's kind of neat to connect with you since you've been working on it for a little while. A little while. Yes, I have. That's great. Well, Larry, what is your superpower? Um, so I think that my superpower is enabling other people to use their creative energy. No, oh, fantastic. Great superpower, Larry. Well, Larry, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, I, I know you're busy. But before you go, would you take just a minute and tell everyone how they can learn more about Interstate Renewable Energy Council and how they can connect with you personally? Yes, absolutely. So Interstate Renewable Energy Council, our website is irecusa, I-R-E-C-U-S-A dot org. And you can reach me on Twitter at LL Sherwood. Fantastic. Larry, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. We wish you every success in accelerating the pace of solar and wind adoption and other renewable energies. You got a big project ahead of you and we wish you luck with it. Great. Well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed talking with you today. All right. Let's do some good. At Caring Crowd, we believe everyone 
has the power to make a difference. Through our crowdfunding platform for community health, we empower passionate people to drive real change. Whether you work for a nonprofit organization, volunteer, or want to get involved for the first time, you can post a campaign on Caring Crowd. Join us, because caring is where change begins. Thanks for tuning in to the Your Mark on the World Show, the Social Impact Podcast. Please subscribe via YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or Spotify. Spotify.